<laughs> okay, so uh, welcome back to, uh, from lunch, everyone. We will continue where we sort of uh, stopped before lunch with the need and the role for research and also the need for practical uh, and evidence-based work on gender, peace and security. And uh, I'm very, very happy to hear officially launch the 1325 Research Working Group's book on gender, peace and security. And uh, together with my co-editor, Ismene Yuselis from the University of Essex. It's been a very, very good cooperation and from for which I'm very happy. Together with uh, two members of the research working group, Carl Beardsley from uh, Duke University and uh, Ragnhild Nordås from PRIO uh, in Oslo. Uh, and we are also very happy to have Dan Smith from International Alert to give comments and raise central questions about the book uh, at the end. And after our talk, which will be in a form of sort of mini TED Talks, so this will be exciting, uh, I will also open the floor for questions. So why a book on gender, peace and security? So let me start by telling you a bit of a personal uh, story. In uh, early 1999, the Swedish Foreign Ministry asked Uppsala University to assist with the gender mainstreaming of UN peace operations. Uh, because I wanted the, the Foreign Ministry wanted to Uppsala University to bring collect all existing research and bring together researchers and policymakers to assist an ongoing project at the Department of Peacekeeping Operations uh, in New York, which was led by the Air Lessons Learned Unit. And Professor Wallenstein that we heard earlier uh, today led the project and he hired me as a newly baked master student to assist. And my job in this was to write a so background paper on what we knew at that point in time about gender and peace operations. Now, many of you had advised students on how to select the most important articles and books for such a project, which is not easy. But selection in this case was not going to be an issue. At this point in time, gender and peace operations were a non-issue in research. There were three research articles all together that focused on gender and peace operations. And about perhaps 10 that empirically focused on women and peace sort of more broadly. And all of these, they were descriptive, which is kind of symptomatic of an early research field. So we didn't really know that much of what would work and what didn't work. And this project then uh, joined together with central ongoing efforts by women's organization in, uh, in New York that were trying to pressure the Security Council to take women, peace and security more seriously. Uh, that eventually then were to result in Resolution 1325 in October 2000. So why am I telling you all of this? Well, this means that actually at the time of the resolution 15 years ago, we did not know that much about the issues that are formulated in the resolution. We actually didn't know how things work and we didn't have the empirical research to back it up. We knew that women were important for international peace and security and we knew we had to take it seriously. But that's basically where we were. So the difference now 15 years later is quite striking. Research is booming, the number of pro policy projects is booming. Uh, and UN has now also launched the global study, as we heard about in the earlier panel, in order to try to understand where are we in the implementation process and where do we need to go from here. But one area that we find is still very much lacking concerns, as we also discussed earlier, the lack of gender disaggregated data. And the collection of such information is important to understand and sort of motivate why we need a gender perspective uh, in the first place and also to identify how can we then approach the different problems that we face in a more effective way. And uh, so if we look at the themes of the book, the uh, book seeks to address precisely that by presenting new data and, and critical central debates on three themes of the resolution, participation, protection and gender mainstreaming. And Ismene Giselis and I have shared a wish to contribute to a deepened debate on these issues, issues that are very much still dominated by assumptions more perhaps than facts. And as Clint Eastwood tells us, assumption is the mother of all screw-ups in research as well as in policy. <laughs> so we are therefore very happy to uh, uh, have the contributors to the book, which has really focused on, on, on these issues, uh, to, to come and present to us sort of key findings and how we can take this knowledge further. So first, Kyle will talk about his and Sabrina Karim's research about women's participation in peace operations in the military components of UN peace operations. Why is it so difficult to, to increase this number? Because we've known 
for 15 to 20 years now. We need to increase the number, but nothing seems to be happening. Second, we have Ragnhild, who will talk about the conclusions from one of the chapters on protection, uh, namely on sexual exploitation and abuse, which is one of the themes or, or problems that actually made the Security Council sit up and pay attention for why they needed to take gender more seriously. But it's also an area that is very much under-researched till today, and the lack of information has been one of the key problems that her uh, chapter seeks to address. And last, my co-editor editor is Mene Yaselis, who will talk about our findings on gender mainstreaming, now this is a key approach to most international uh, organizations when they want to address the resolution, but this is actually the area that perhaps is still most in want of more systematic research. And thereafter, as I said, we are very happy to have Dan then sort of bring these conclusions together and, and take us one step further in, in, in how we use this. So with that uh, short introduction, I leave the floor to you, Kyle. Thank you. It's an uh, honor to be part of this book project as well as to be part of this panel. This is part of a larger project that Sabrina, Kareem, and I uh, have been working on related to women in peacekeeping and in confronting the challenges of male dominance in peace operations. Specifically in this book chapter, we're looking at the, um, the, um, the participation of women in peace operations and asking the question of to which countries do women uh, tend to deploy, as well as from which countries do women tend to deploy. So some of our motivating questions include, do women actually get sent to the missions where there's greatest need for external involvement of peacekeepers? And then maybe more specifically, do women get sent to the missions in which there are higher rates of sexual and gender-based violence, where at a minimum, the women might improve access to victims of sexual and gender-based violence, or, and this is something that's uh, debated in the literature, um, provide additional perspectives and skill sets to address the underlying causes of uh, sexual and gender-based violence. Sabrina and I look at the factors of the destination countries, as well as the factors in the contributing countries that affect the proportions of women uh, that are sent on missions. Uh, we have three main findings that I'd like to highlight, and if they are up on the screen. Um, the first two of these findings uh, show what we call a gendered protection norm, in which women still tend to be seen as objects to be protected rather than as assets of protection, that is, as protectors. And so the first finding is that women tend to, de to deploy to the safest missions. And by that, I mean the missions with fewer or with lower rates of peacekeeping fatalities, with lower rates of battle-related fatalities, as well as uh, lower issues of, uh, of, of uh, extreme poverty um, in the destination countries. And we find this especially for the military components um, but also some evidence uh, suggests that um, there's uh, some selection with regard to the police uh, personnel. Our second finding on this uh, theme of a gender protection norm is that the contributing countries that have experienced recent armed conflict tend to actually send more women in their peacekeeping missions. And we think that this also suggests a gender protection norm where deployments abroad tend to be seen as safer if the security environment at, ho at home is rather perilous. And so we highlight a few implications for, these, um, for this finding uh, re regarding the gender protection norm. One implication is that we should guard against uh, too much emphasis on the role of women as victims in conflict. Um, that uh, seeing women just as victims might tend to entrench some of these norms that women are better uh, seen as protectees rather than as pro protectors. In addition, we think that it's, um, it's important to not focus too much on the numbers and the proportions of women that are being sent as uh, our policy outcomes. Um, if that means that we are losing track of how well we are using the women that are sent on missions. And so we think that there are wrong ways to do gender mainstreaming and gender balancing, especially if those ways tend to actually entrench harmful gender norms um, and, uh, and, and harmful stereotypes. Uh, the third finding uh, that, that we uh, look at and that I wish to, to highlight is that contributors with better uh, practices of uh, gender norms at home, or of, uh, of, of gender equality at home, as well as with uh, better um, balances of women and their armed forces at home, uh, tend, to, tend to do better in sending women on, uh, on peacekeeping missions. Now, it may not be surprising that if you have a larger pool of, 
pool of women at home, that you tend to send uh, higher uh, numbers of, of women abroad. But we think that this finding that actual practice of gender equality at home, that is higher rates of participation in the labor force by women at home, tend to correlate with, uh, with higher rates of uh, women sent on peacekeeping missions, is something that's new and something that's interesting. But there also um, comes, uh, uh, it also comes with a cautionary finding, which is that at least with regard to the deployment of police um, personnel, that these very countries that are doing well with regard to the participation of women in labor force tend to be the most um, uh, affected by the security uh, risk in the destination countries. That is, in the countries that are doing quite well with regard to gender equality at home, still tend to struggle with this gender protection norm. Some of the implications that follow from this link between the domestic environment and the international uh, contributions, um, I think really suggests that reforms at home are quite essential to improve gender equality within and through peacekeeping missions. And so efforts that are part of the 1325 agenda, especially the national action plans, um, are quite essential in improving the pool of women from which peacekeeping missions can draw, as well as the willingness of countries um, and their uh, senior personnel to deploy women uh, to, to missions. I'd like to highlight one final implication of our, of, our, of our work, which is that if the proportion of women in peace operations is still likely to be rather low uh, for the foreseeable future, that we do need to emphasize um, better how well we are using the women that are sent. And so in some additional uh, findings that Sabrina and I have done related to more uh, case study work, um, we find that um, there are many restrictions that are often um, placed on women uh, in the missions um, that, that, they're, that they're sent to. That is, that they're often confined to base and have uh, an inability to really engage the communities that they serve. And we think that this is something that's regrettable and something that should be reversed. Peacekeepers of all types, men and women, can learn to be better at enhancing security if they can actually practice security enhancement. In addition, the communities that they're serving can better realize um, a value for gender equality as, as a goal to pursue if they can actually practice engagement with women in the security sector that are fully empowered to carry out their mission mandates. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Ragnhild? Yes. <coughs> so um, UN Security Council Resolution 1325 demands more inclusion of women in all aspects of peace building. Um, it also points out how women can be particularly vulnerable in certain um, situations. Uh, sexual exploitation and abuse by peacekeepers clearly undermines the ability to implement this resolution. It undermines the credibility and the legitimacy of uh, peace operations and the international actors that are involved in uh, peace operations. It can also have severe local consequences, everything from unwanted pregnancies, spread of diseases, uh, changing uh, gender relations in the local population, and many other negative effects. Um, sexual exploitation and abuse can be a great many things. With the um, zero tolerance policy um, established by the UN, uh, even uh, sexual rel relationships that are not coercive or clearly involving uh, some monetary transaction can be considered exploitative. But there have been reports of everything from uh, these types of relationships to transactional sex and all the way up to rape uh, forced at gunpoint. However, uh, sexual exploitation and abuse does vary quite significantly. It, there are some places and some troops that are able to control this and prevent this from happening, whereas in other places uh, these behaviors are quite rampant. Uh, in order to understand why this is happening and to find some solutions, we need to understand that vari variation. So in this study, uh, Cide de and I, we ask uh, where and when is sexual exploitation and abuse by peacekeepers likely to be reported? Uh, in order to try to answer this question, we had to collect some data. Uh, and there was not really any usable data uh, out there that could, could answer some of the questions that we had. So we looked at all the 36 peacekeeping operations um, in the time period 1999 to 2010 by UN, NATO, ECOWAS and the African Union. Uh, and we use open source data. Uh, and the main things that we find 
uh, are listed on the slide. The risk f one of the risk factors for seeing sexual exploitation and abuse by peacekeepers is to have large operations. Of course, if you have many people, many troops on the ground, there's a higher chance that there will be, let's call them, sexual predators amongst the troops. The other thing, though, that is more important with that finding is that it suggests that the control and monitoring of behavior is much more difficult in larger operations. The other thing that we find is that um, when a peacekeeping uh, operation or a peace operation tries to deal with a situ situation with uh, high levels of sexual violence in the war, we s tend to see much more reports of sexual exploitation and abuse. The way that we interpret that is that in these situations there are many vulnerable women, many are survivors of sexual violence, they might be shunned by their families and their communities and turn to transactional sex for survival. Um, at least this is part of what we think explains this finding. Um, so uh, the third finding that is important to say is that it is not enough to just put gender in the mandates and think that that solves anything. We don't find any discernible effect of just having gender or women mentioned in the mandate of the peace operation. So clearly there needs to be action and not only words. Um, there, is, there are quite a few challenges trying to study this uh, phenomenon of sexual exploitation and abuse by peacekeepers for many different reasons. Getting access to good, transparent, reliable data is such a challenge. Uh, and this, I think, stems from the political sensitivities involved. Uh, it is um, not easy to have those that actually do uh, have data to give up this data for independent analysis. Um, and a lot of these uh, activities are uh, underreported and hidden. But the conclusions or the implications that we can draw from the research up to this point, even with the quite limited data that exists, I think is that we need to strengthen the reporting mechanisms and the, the abilities to monitor troops. And also, I think that involves uh, protection of whistleblowers. I think that's an important um, aspect to be able to handle this problem. Um, another uh, solution, maybe, or something that could help um, control with troops is to strengthen the command responsibility to make those that ha have control over troops or should have control over troops because it is their job, to make them responsible for what the troops are doing. I think this could um, have good effects and make us better able to, to deal with these large operations. In terms of the finding on sexual violence, uh, here I think we need more to look at the communities that peace operations are um, meeting, and if there's anything we can do to reduce the stigma of being a survivor of sexual violence in the local communities, I think this, and to empower survivors of sexual violence, I think this could uh, be um, one step in the right direction in, in reducing the problem of sexual exploitation and abuse by peacekeepers. So when and if we're able to overcome the problem of lack of information, uh, then hopefully we can find better uh, and more solid evidence-based solution. Thank you, Rangel. It is fascinating with the, uh, the question of sexual exploitation and abuse. I did interviews in East Timor and I think everyone knows, knew what the peacekeepers had been doing. It was the most well-known fact in terms of, of what the peacekeeping operation was up to, actually. So it's, it has a high cost. Uh, Ismene? Okay, so the last theme of this book is gender mainstreaming. In my chapter with Jana Krauser, we have an overview of the literature on gender mainstreaming, an area that still needs to be explored and studied. Why is that? Well, the problem is that when gender mainstreaming is implemented, a lot of the activities are highly gender. So when it comes to women, the emphasis is on subsistence agriculture, small fruit farms, small livestock. That's not sustainable, it's inefficient, and it further marginalizes women. Now, we are in Sweden, and I Sweden is one of the pioneers in gender mainstreaming. But let's remind ourselves that when the Economic and Social Council came with the they developed the concept in 1997, 
that this is a general strategy for gender equality in both development and peace. Now, this strategy implies two things. The first of all, it should be for both men and women combined, integral actors in these processes. We also know that that means that we need to be aware of the implications of the actions, uh, the programs, any kind of project that gets involved, and how that affects both men and women. What research suggests is that gender equality is an important factor, contributing factor to both peace and development. Now, in one of the chapters in our book, uh, Helen Bassini has looked at gender mainstreaming and how it was implemented in decommissioning programs in Liberia. Especially she looked at uh, female, uh, wh females who were ex-combatants or participated with fighting forces in Liberia. And she looked at the main program, that was from 2004 to 2007, and the residual case uh, program from 2008 to 2009. Now, the main program was woefully underfunded whereas the residual program, at least, was better funded. N regardless, she found that, first of all, women's organizations in Liberia were never integrated in the process. She also found that women, even when they were offered vocational training, this was highly gender. There was no acknowledgement of the preferences or the needs of these women or any market analysis. Moreover, there was no recognition of whether there were families or any kind of society structures that could support these women. And the trauma that these women experienced during the war was never acknowledged. Contrast that to other gender mainstreaming programs, especially in development, and an example from Peru, where they actually look at the, the role and responsibilities of women in production, and they emphasize the training and the capacity of women to join groups with men, and uh, groups and organization, mixed, not separate. Because gender mainstreaming should be about the transformation of societies and institutions, and not just about women's stuff, as someone told me a few months ago. But ultimately, gender mainstreaming is important, and we should care about it, because it actually leads to more prosperous societies with less conflict. So if that's the case, what can we do? So even though this is an area with the least systematic research available, there are some lessons learned based on some of that we introduce in our book. First of all, all kind of policies and projects that introduce gender mainstreaming must be embedded in so local social structures. The second is that men and women should be considered together as integral actors in the peace processes. Separate is not equal in this context. Last but not least, findings so far suggest that long-term horizon programs with sufficient funding that emphasize both training and capacity building to enhance mixed networks are the most successful. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, Dan, I'll leave the floor to you. Well, thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation to be here. And congratulations to the editors and authors of, of this book. Um, which seems to me to have, to begin with, one important uh, quality, which is that it gets beyond simply counting women. And I think that one of the difficulties is that we have persistently been stuck over the last 10 to 15 years with the sense of it's, it's all about participation, it's all about the numbers. And the whole point of, uh, it's not just the quantity, it's also the quality of engagement. It's ju not just the number of women who are engaged in a peace process, it is also what the peace process itself is. All of these issues, I think, have come together much more strongly in this book than I have, have seen in um, a lot of the literature. So congratulations on that. Um, I forget when it was now, actually, because I'm getting old, so my memory is fading. But it was about 15 years ago, a little, maybe a little bit before 1325, that I co-edited a book. I was looking back at my CV the other day, but some parts of it, you know, the type is faded. I can't read it properly <laughs> and, unless I put the other glasses on and so on. But together with Inge Schalsbeck, uh, I co-edited a book, uh, Gender, Peace and Conflict, um, so, some, some while back. And I want to, first of all, um, thoroughly agree with what you were saying, that, you know, in 2000, in the, in the early 2000s, there was 
there was so little material uh, on which something like 1325 could be based. And I want to come back to that because in one sense I think it's something, it's a thought to which we should return. But one of the things which is interesting to me, looking at the material now and thinking back to that book and that time and what we were writing then, is that this argument about function versus right still seems to be there. Are you in fact, we're talking about numbers of women, right? We're talking about participation. Do we want more women because that makes a better peace? Or do we want more women because it is right that women have a fair share of the action because that's what's fair? And I'm, you know, actually this is a really quite silly argument when you think about it. But it's extraordinary how it keeps on, it keeps on coming back. There's another resurgence of it now. Why is it a silly argument? Why do I say that? Because it's an argument which you can only have and take really seriously if you somehow manage to disconnect the idea or the, the ideas which you're discussing from underlying values. Right? And the most important of those being something I've referred to already, which is what kind of peace do you mean? How peace is defined? Once you start talking actually about peace and what the content of peace is and what is the place of conflict, what is the place of justice, what is the place of dispute within peace, what is the place of power within peace? I mean, unless the peace that you're talking about is one in which basically life has ended, then there are going to be people who are richer, more powerful, stronger, faster, smarter, dumber, wiser, more beautiful in Sweden, more beautiful again, yet more beautiful, of course, <laughs> no negatives allowed. Um, society is made up of difference. Some of that difference leads to incompatibilities. Some of those incompatibilities lead to dispute and conflict. How do you handle those? What is the role of all of these things in peace? What is the connection between peace and the idea of social progress? Once you get into those discussions, the argument about whether you're having more women in because it's fair or because it's, um, it's more effective starts to disappear because what you're arguing about and what you're discussing is, is what you want in this world and what you want by way of peace. Where that's taken us in international alert as we've thought these things through is towards what, for want of a better term, we've described as a gender relational approach. That is to say that we want the emphasis now to be falling on gender relationships. That that is, in a sense, what we're talking about is the importance of defining the topic and not just, um, not just defining the data. So where does 1325, which I think mention, does it mention the word gender once or twice? I, I forget, but it's not, it's not very often. It's primarily, it's about women peace and security. It's not about gender peace and security, 1325. Where does 1325 and that process fit into that? Because these issues of actually of participation, but also obviously of protection, indeed of mainstreaming, they are all issues about gender relations. Right? The, you cannot divorce the question of the number of women who are in participating in any kind of political or social process from the question of the uh, social relations around gender. And I just want to look very quickly, very, very quickly at each of the three uh, topics you've been highlighting. Um, and for two of them, I'm going to take a, a couple of uh, World War II examples. I'm not quite that old, but they just occurred to me <laughs> as I was listening to you. Um, the first one is to do with participation. I'm really struck by this thing of the attachment to low-risk deployment. Right? What is going on with low-risk deployment? Something really, really visceral. Something in the gut. Something that is anthropological and institutional and goes beyond rules and beyond quotas. And here are my two World War II examples about this. Women flew combat aircraft for the Royal Air Force during the Battle of Britain. One detail, they flew those combat aircraft, but they were not allowed to use them in combat. They delivered them. They were therefore trained to the level of being able to fly the 1940, 41, 42, 43 equivalent of fast jets. As much training was invested in them as could be so that they could get into a new aircraft take it off, fly it to a battle of, to a frontline airfield, land it, get out of it, and then presumably be driven back to, to their starting point again. Sometimes 
they were actually shot at by German planes as they were landing. Right? They were not allowed to shoot back. So they were allowed to be in combat in their combat aircraft, but they were not allowed to use those aircraft in combat. I worded the sentence very carefully. Women were also deployed on anti-aircraft batteries, you know, the guns to uh, shoot down bombers as they were coming. They were allowed to pick the shell up, together with somebody else, because these are heavy things, and put them in. They were allowed to target the gun onto the plane. They then stood aside. Man stepped up, boom, fire. There's something really, really visceral going on when you get these kind of crazy distinctions coming in. So, all right, on to the exploitation and abuse thing. Uh, first of all, I just want to say that while the UN might have a zero tolerance policy in writing, it doesn't actually have a zero tolerance policy in practice. Uh, again, why not? Again, something visceral is going on there. It's something to do with the military institution, and it's to do with manhood. And it's to do with norms which persist whatever the rules say and just to give you an example again from world war ii of how far the rules can go in saying something yet the behavior persists general Patton's memoirs won a battle i forget what one it was in early 1945 before the battle he called in um, the senior officer in the military police in his army corps and what Patton says is i explained to him that I knew there was going to be some raping, and I wanted the hanging to start as soon as possible afterwards. Now, that was a beautifully pragmatic attitude by Patton. These soldiers are going to have a fight, then they're going to rape some women, we're going to catch some of them, we'll hang them, and then we'll move on. All right? But presumably, every soldier knew that. All right? The rules were clear. Don't go raping women. Before battle, during battle, after battle, whatever, don't. If you do, you, you, we may catch you, and if we catch you, you'll lose your life. But whatever, it's going to go on. There is something visceral, in, there's something in the gut about what a military institution looks like, and how it behaves, and how its members are. And there's a lot to get over. And the same with the mainstreaming. I mean, the translation of mainstreaming into tokenism is visceral again. It's, yes, of course we mainstream, of course we mainstream. Why? Because that puts it in a safe place. Somehow the mainstream has just become not even quite a tributary. It's become a diversion. What all of this tells me, in a way, is that, of course, again, I congratulate the editors and authors of this book. The scholarship, and in particularly empirical research, is enormously important in breaking down the stereotypes in breaking down the grip of ignorance, in getting through the policy blinkers, and in breaking down barriers. But in the end, we're going to be have, have to be conscious and careful all the way through to be clear that what we're really talking about is what kind of world we want and what kind of peace we want. If this discussion isn't closely tied all the time to values and the question of what kind of peace we want, that discussion will in the end go nowhere because it is a f it's fundamentally a political, social discussion to be having. Thanks very much. Ms. Bond, I think we'll collect a few questions for the audience and then we can do uh, a reflection on, on, on Dan comments and, and from the audience at the same time. So do we have any? Who wants to start? <laughs> all right, then I'll let the, the panelists uh, respond shortly before, and then you can do all the thinking you need before uh, I, I come back to you. Kyle, would you like to? to I was hoping for some more time to think. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, so uh, these are excellent comments, and uh, thank you for. Um, your kind words about th about the project. Um, so, I, I, I agree with you that uh, there is something going on that, that is quite visceral about how we um, about the origin of these norms um, and then how they are carried out in practice. Um, sort of two reflections. Uh, one is that yes, while I agree it's it's visceral, there's also of course it's political. Um, uh, that there uh, are a tremendous um, um, 
power in the, the power of gender hierarchies. Um, and that maintaining that order um, there's, uh, and upsetting that order would actually create winners and losers. And um, I think so, um, while I think we can accept that there is a visceral um, element, I think we can also think about some of the institutions and policies that we might in place to try to adjust the, 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 the political element to, to carry out the, um, or to seek the ends um, of, of gender equality for the ends themselves, but yet also taking into account um, some of the practicalities of what it means to create some of these winners and losers as we, as we upset the, the gender norms. The second thing I wanted to uh, suggest is that um, we do, uh, Sabrina and I take a, in, in this uh, chapter, uh, a large N empirical approach. And while, we're a, a, while we are able to point out some of these patterns, we can't actually point to what the specific causes are and, and, and whether these visceral reactions are psychological or s sociological or political or, or combination. And, um, um, but I think there is a call for greater work that can do that, uh, micro-level uh, studies as well as perhaps experimental work uh, to the extent that we can um, uh, tr uh, create treatments and controls with regard to people's experiences and, um, and um, uh, entrenchment of some of these norms. Thank you, Ragnel, would you like to? Yes, <coughs> thank you for very uh, important um, comments. That I fully agree that we need to think about what type of peace we want. And I'm also very wary of all questions of women's participation uh, in particular being for other reasons than for it being what should be done because it's right, uh, bef because we have the right. Um, but I think it helps propel the urgency forward of uh, making the political changes necessary when you can also find that it has good side effects. <laughs> uh, now on the, um, in terms of the, the norms um, and certain norms or ideas of what manhood or masculinity is or what a soldier is and how, how sticky some of the norms can be uh, and that certain things persist, whatever the rules are. To some extent, I can agree with that, or I understand where you're coming from. These are not things that are necessarily easy to change. Uh, norms, uh, especially when you don't enforce the, the changes in behavior, can become very sticky. But I think that we should not assume that boys will be boys and that nothing can be done. And I think there's quite substantive evidence that things can change, norms can change, and behaviors can change. There are groups that are able to control the behavior of the soldiers uh, under direct uh, observation, like keeping close check on soldiers, but even um, through training and through uh, ideological discussion, uh, through uh, strengthening certain norms you want to establish, this can, this can be done. So some of my work is on sexual violence, both by state armies and rebel groups and, and militia groups. Uh, and here, there's in that literature, there's also quite significant evidence that there are many groups that do not result to sexual violence, that do not use it. And that's not only because we are um, not seeing it and it's underreporting. We, we know that some groups are effectively uh, able to control undesired behavior by the troops. So I think that is good news for the work on sexual exploitation and abuse uh, by peacekeepers as well. We know that strong command with the right values, with the professional training and the sense of what it is to be a professional soldier, including protection, um, of women or to not engage in such undesirable um, behavior is possible to achieve. So um, I think I'll leave my first uh, comment there and on a more positive note that I think we shouldn't feel like there's nothing that can be done. Well, a um, few months ago I had to give a promotional presentation at the Colchester Castle that was destroyed by Boudica on uh, women and war. So basically, I uh, started by having a pic pictures of uh, female warlords throughout the history. And uh, the response of, uh, these were average people from Colchester. Um, most of the women eventually were attracted and they started engaging with me. A lot of the men, one of them told me the women stuff, <laughs> basically uh, refused to engage. 
And of course, that makes you wonder when we're talking about Britain, or bo although Britain, for an outsider like myself, is a highly militarized society, uh, if in a country that is claimed to be developed, you have these kind of responses, what chances do you have when you go to a developing country? And yet, I believe that, and I'm a, I'm a pragmatist, that changing behaviors step by step might actually change uh, beliefs as well because of cognitive dissonance. So if programs take into account and are, there is a conscious un understanding of the implications of what it means to just target women and isolate them instead of incorporating, and then efficiency, might actually lead to a change in norms if people see improvements in their lives. So that's my take on things. So a rather more positive of a pra uh, opinion of a pragmatist. Uh, now I have uh, Victor Alsal in the audience. Hi. So I had two questions, but Ismin just answered one of them, so I won't ask that one again. Uh, my second question is, uh, well, let me just also comment. It sounds like a fascinating book, and I'll be asking my library to, to get one as soon as I get back. Uh, but in some ways, you're covering three topics that are very similar. But in some ways, they're actually three topics that are very different. I mean, there's, there's real differences between participation, protection, and, and gender mainstreaming. So I was wondering, where do you see the, the major similarities in findings between these three efforts, and where are the major differences in these three efforts? Do we have any more? Should we collect some? Mm -hmm. oh. uh, Caitlin Ryan, Ohio University. Uh, just a quick question for, for Kyle, actually. You, you said something in, in relation to uh, participation about national action plans uh, perhaps being a, a good way to increase women's participation. I was wondering if you could explain why you think this is the case. Kyle, do you want to start with that? Uh? Sure. Well, the uh, I think Victor's quest question is something that maybe all Very of us can take, one, especially yeah. uh, <laughs> especially uh, you and Ismini um, having the, the the broader focus. I'm gonna, I want to focus on uh, Caitlin's question real quick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for that out. Nice way of coaching. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the out, Caitlin. Uh, although it, it is it is actually a tricky question. So. Um, so why national action plans? So, so I guess uh, it's the um, the principle um, and the idea of the national action plans. Um, if uh, if I'm reading uh, some of the work uh, coming out of the 1325 uh, group uh, correctly, rather than um, saying that the way that the national action plans are currently being implemented is ideal, and that we can just rely on that. Um, I think that's uh, so. The the point of my comment was that I think that the um, uh, one of the tangible things that have come out of the 1325 initiative are these national a action plans. I, I, I see that as a sign of a movement in the right direction. That doesn't, this isn't a top-down approach of, okay, let's just get the policies right at the UN level or at the, the global level, and that somehow we're going we're gonna to solve all these issues, but that if we're going to make real progress, it's going to be at the domestic level. And so, um, again, I'm not an expert on national action plans, so maybe, I, maybe this isn't the way, the way forward, but, but my sense um, is that uh, if we are, are able to do better with the national action plans, um, have them less be sort of copy and paste from other national action plans, spend the deliberation uh, for each particular country to think about the reforms that are actually necessary, getting the local political will to actually implement the national action plans, then we can actually see um, the real improvements um, to be able to make a lot of progress on participation, both in terms of the actual representation of women as well as um, the quality of how we're um, actually using the women that, that, that are deployed um, to be able to get at some of those underlying uh, norms that are keeping women from signing up for their local armed services in the first place, as well as keeping uh, force commanders um, and other, um, other personnel along the way from restricting uh, the um, access that women have to actually engage the communities. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want if I... No, go something? ahead. I yeah. have some. Uh, I think that's a, that's a brilliant question, and I think it ties very nicely into, I think, also what was Dan was driving, sort of what, what kind of, of problems are we really dealing with here that, uh, that the resolution in and by itself tried to, to, to make a push for. Uh, and I think, I think there are two things that have sort of guided us in terms of, of how we worked with the book. I think one is the, the sort of course, the underlying problem with gender equality, uh, sort of more generally, but I think 
a little bit different perhaps and, and I think uh, Rangel also uh, and, and Ismene alluded to this also in terms of I think we see it less as a fixed structure and more as, as sort of variations in terms of, of resource distributions and norms that these norms and, and, and roles and, and the value given to masculinity and femininity tend to vary to a, to a quite a high degree uh, which means that they aren't as fixed perhaps as we originally thought 15 years ago and, and I think with the, the collection of data and, and more and more in-depth analysis fr from the researcher side and, and from the policy side, trying to identify and, and find the, the, the main problems within the organization, sort of know where to kick in order to, to make something happen. And I think that you uh, then identified very key areas in terms of, okay, so what kind of masculinity norms are we really dealing with here? Because they are underlying many of these, uh, these problems that, of course, that this relates to. Uh, but I think also the way that we chose the chapter was that these are also key questions where we had very little sort of systematic knowledge or, or sort of we wanted to, to really contribute to, to, to new data to these areas because they are very dominant within the, the debate on 1325 but within statistical research and more sort of the collection of larger data sets there's still very little that had been done. There was a lot of really good case studies and, and sort of dialogues going on, but not so much uh, from this perspective. So that's also why we chose uh, some of these chapters. But I think that you're right. I think that it's, it is definitely a question also about the, the political level. And I think, again, I'll return to what I talked about, or just mentioned during the feminist panel, that when we reviewed sort of EU's approach to this, it is fascinating that they haven't really defined the, uh, the deliverables on the political level. So and until an organization actually have a deliverable that, that they can understand in terms of, you know, this is what I want you to change and, and then you should develop a plan for me to, to know how to do it, until we really see that. And I think that's one of the key things with the feminist foreign policy that it actually been lifted up to the, to the higher level. And I think we've actually been heading there for since 1948, <laughs> but I think we're really actually <laughs> starting to, to get to that point. So I, I think you really underlined a really key questions here. Um, if I may. Uh, in terms of gender mainstreaming, I don't necessarily see it as parallel to uh, participation, sexual exploitation, because I think since it's a grand strategy, it kind of uh, permeates the other two themes. So in, you can see how gender mainstream, for instance, when it comes to participation, you have to consider the implications. What does it mean for women to participate? How many women should participate? This gender balancing will it make things better for women, worse? And I think Kyle and Sabrina have done a lot of experiments also in, in Liberia where they show that depending on the context, you might get different outcomes. Some of them might actually be counterproductive and uh, against uh, the advancement and pro uh, progress of women. So I think gender mainstreaming is more like an underlying theme throughout rather than a separate theme per se, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Dan, would you like to tell me? Questions, we should take those, but I do have a comment to make. Yeah, I, I could <laughs> see that you were. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, there are no. Okay. Um, Sabrina Karim from Emory University. Um, I'm curious to know, since we've launched the book, what the next steps in the research agenda for 1325 should be. Um, so if you could comment about how this book kind of prepares us for the next steps, that'd be great. Oh, thank you. Another really good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have more? Does anyone? Ah, there. Hi, Honduras, Essex University. I actually was struck by, by your comment, Louise, that there was very little research, at least quantitative research, by the time this resolution got adopted. So I'm kind of wondering if you think in terms of maybe adopting another resolution, what has your research kind of delivered on how to rephrase uh, you know, what should be a new resolution? <laughs> An even more difficult question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And I think there was a, a, a lady behind you also. Yeah. Um, thank you. Just to add to the political discussion, about maybe one th way forward that's fruitful in terms of generating research is to distinguish also between the political outcomes that we're after and what the political process looks like to achieve those outcomes, including in terms of developing recommendations about how to support 
that political navigation and contestation that, mm. that needs to take place. Mm. Thank you. Definitely. Mm. Who would like to? Shall let I can perhaps let Dan. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> obviously, norms can and do change. Uh, and they can change and do change under the impact of social and political movements of different kinds. That's clear. Right? So nothing which talks about how deeply embedded and how visceral uh, many of these issues are is an argument to say, therefore, it is inevitable that they go on. They are eternal and unchanging and everlasting. So that, that said, I just wanted to pick up quickly on a comment which you made, Louise. You said the norms are perhaps less fixed than we thought 15 years ago. Yeah, but perhaps they're more agile <laughs> or adaptive or adaptable. Um, perhaps they're more plastic than they seem. And if you think about an awful lot of political issues, that constantly seems to be the case. I mean, reaction back against a progressive move doesn't have to be harsh. It can also be a matter of you know, what used to be called repressive tolerance. The system kind of reshapes itself to allow that bit of freedom and keeps this part of power going. And it's done so smartly that you could almost believe that there was a kind of, you know, an intelligence behind it, a mind. But it's not. It's just that that's the way that systems of power do work. Uh, there was a point before World War I when people thought genuinely that if women had the vote, that would lead to a total revolution of everything. And there were some people who thought that was a good thing and they supported uh, suffragettes, and there were some people who thought that was a bad thing, and they put those suffragettes in prison and let them starve themselves, right? But they were all wrong. It led to big and important changes. It led to enormous improvements over time in the conditions of women, right? But the power is still the power. The new boss is pretty much the same as the old boss, and so on. So it's more to understand this that I'm talking about, not to say, oh, forget it, it's not gonna change, but it is an ongoing process all the time. And I think that the distinction you made between the political outcomes and the political process and bearing that in mind could also be a part of answering that other tricky question you had, which is about next steps in the research uh, agenda. So yes, I mean, I certainly don't want anything that I said to be interpreted as a mes message of um, pessimism. I'm a relentlessly optimistic person. <laughs> Good, we have that in common. <laughs> He's many. Oh, um, yes. Uh, well, in terms of uh, Louise and I have some plans uh, to continue our work on gender mainstreaming because, as I said, this is the area that is probably the most understudied. Uh, so we don't really know a lot of what does it mean to gender mainstream, how does that transforms, uh, and what the implications are. So I think that's the one area that really needs to... Uh, but the <laughs> we don't even have any data, we don't have anything pretty much. So it's a, a, uh, a good area to explore. Hmm. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yes, um, so I actually want to go back just and say something on, on Victor's uh, question <laughs> about how these things uh, are similar or different. I think um, we assume that uh, they are different, but that they can reinforce each other. Uh, and I think that that might be true. Um, so that uh, participation of women can increase protection and you know, mainstreaming some, some sort of organic process will sort of appear by itself. And I think that's, um, that's a little bit uh, overstated how, how easy some people think that, or that you can just uh, put a woman on the job and things will change dramatically, for instance. There are some simplistic assumptions out there that I think need to be uh, studied much more carefully and there is work ongoing to do that. So there are maybe no easy quick fixes or mechanical things you can do uh, to change things um, overnight. Um, but I think that one of the advantages at this stage in the, in the research is that much more effort has been put into uh, collecting data systematically uh, and in a way that can contribute to the mainstreaming. <laughs> If you have some data uh, on these types of topics, 
that other researchers that are in outside of this smaller group of researchers can utilize in uh, meaningful ways, then I think we will be able to, to generate knowledge at a much, fa much faster pace than when we stay in the silo because we don't, uh, we're not uh, either approachable or usable um, to a wider, uh, wider group of researchers. So I think there is some promising science now with new data, new systematic data that can be used in the more mainstream uh, parts of the academy. Um, and of course, in general, we have much more opportunities now to create, uh, to, um, to generate more systematic data uh, in research overall. So it's a sort of a good time to latch on to that development and, and um, uh, really make some progress there. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I, w I wanted to take up the question on the connection between um, the outcomes that we seek and the processes and the policies that it takes to get there. Um, I mean, that's that's a, a extremely important question. So, of course, the outcome that I think we we're seeking is gender equality. Um, and what does that look like? Well, it looks like equal participation. It looks like um, um, uh, policies where there's no impunity for uh, violations of, of gender equality and accountability for those that um, that do violate. Um, it means everyone has a, a value for gender equality. Well, what are the policies to get there, right? It's, it's privately improving <laughs> representation of, 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 of women. It's um, uh, changing the policies of impunity and accountability. Um, and so um, it's, it's, it's really tricky to figure out what order those go, go in. And so, um, um, and if we could do that, that'd be great. But of course, it's really difficult to do that because it's, it's difficult to change these underlying norms and underlying practices. Um, but I think it's important to focus on both the top and the, and the, and the grassroots level. Um, so at the grassroots level, I think it's important for everyone that values gender e equality to make this a, a focus of, of, of your work, the focus of your conversations, uh, just to try to get other people on board. Of course, it's really tricky. So we also need, from the top, we need, we need leadership. We need people willing to take risks to maybe try to adjust some of the priorities of what we're talking about at the at the elite and entrepreneur level, um, um, and and what types of policies and what types of resources are diverted uh, to the pursuit of of, of gender uh, um, uh, equality. So I don't think we get there without strong leadership, and I don't think we get there without uh, strong grassroots support. Hmm. Yeah. To to just shortly, I think I'll try to answer the three questions uh, together in terms of the research agenda, the, the uh, what will we do if we wrote 1325 today, and also it's a sort of political process together. Because I think what is coming up, and I, and I think that, because I, I, I didn't take uh, Dan, you to be less of an optimist than I am, I think we'd, we definitely share the, uh, that perspective. And I think what we also have in common is that what well, there is now an increasing research on and a more which sort of ties them to the research agenda is the understanding of, of masculinities but as in plural and mm. of course these were there already when the resolution was written but i think today we're starting to get the empirical evidence and data that really speaks to okay so how does this really work how does it work for the mobilization of soldiers how does it work in sort of the setup of armed conflict per se which is probably why it's so problematic with women in the armed forces was relating to the protection norms so I, I and, uh, and the misbehavior probably. So I, I think uh, it would probably still be women, peace and security, but a much more emphasis, I think, on, on the total so responsibility of all society, that this is not a women's issue. This is actually based on something that's related to male and female roles and even more empirically. So and I think that's also a research in a sense need to go. So okay, what is the interlink here? Because I think at the very end, and what I was struck about when I came into to policy from research is how much of a bureaucratic process poli political processes actually are. <laughs> and, and I think in that, from that perspective, 15 years with 1325 is actually not that long because you actually need to get down to the nitty gritty. Uh, and, and there's been rolling out of, of uh, training of soldiers on 1325. And I was talking to a squad leader and he said, yeah, I had this great information about 1325, but I can't keep that in my side pocket and pull it out when I'm in Afghanistan and say, you do the following thing. So how do you, I mean, it's an enormous amount to translate into practical work, even, even if, if the, the organization is, uh, is uh, a positive. And most often they're not. So it is still a, a huge challenge. 
so with that, I would uh, like to thank the research working group for contributing to the book. It was great working with you, and a very large thank you to the uh, panelists and to, to Dan for, for bringing up all these key questions and really putting us uh, uh, on the line and together, defending it, I think. It was very good. Thank yeah. you very much. Brilliant. No, thank you. And thank you, Luis, and thank you, Asmini, for, for organizing the, uh, the project and for, for your leadership. So let's give them a round of applause. Oh, thank you, Tom. And I think now there's going to be a break, a coffee break, uh, just outside, I think. <laughs>